We're talking about how to get easy good deeds. So, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. InshaAllah ta'ala, if everyone can pay attention now, get settled in. Jazakumullah khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. So who can tell me what we talked about last week? Who can tell me what we talked about last week? If I don't get a single person, I quit. What did I talk about last week? Islam, Hadith, Bukhari. Those are the only clues I'll give you. Yes? Uh huh. Mm hmm. MashaAllah. So, sister just saved the entire halaqa. Right? So, uh, we mentioned a person, it was the hadith of a person accepting Islam. The Prophet ﷺ says that if a person accepts Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all of their sins. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would, uh, and, then, and then the Prophet ﷺ started to mention the various ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward a person. Um, and we said, Al-Islam tahdimu ma kana qabla. The Prophet ﷺ says that Islam does away with everything that came before. And we mentioned also Hajj, right? Hajj does away with everything that came before. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ says, Tawbah, repentance, does away with everything that came before. Hijrah, migration, does away with everything that came before it. And then we have the lengthy discussion about whether or not a person's good deeds that were done before Islam. So a person takes shahada, they come into Islam. So we know that their sins are wiped out. And then we had the discussion of whether or not their good deeds that were done before Islam would count. We concluded that the answer was what? Yes, except for ibadat, obviously, acts of worship. But general virtues and noble traits, honesty, uh, charity, birul uh, walidain, uh, things that people did for their parents and so on and so forth, all of that would count on their scale as well. So when we say that a person becomes like a newborn baby when they become Muslim, they're actually ahead of a newborn baby. All right? They're actually in a very good situation because not only are they forgiven for all of their sins, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala counts all of their good deeds that were done before. And of course, we concluded as well that even for the people that, that, that die in disbelief, that good deeds have benefits for them uh, in the sense that it would, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give them some goodness in this dunya. So it could ease some goodness in this world for them. And in the hereafter, we said, for example, the punishment of Abu Talib is lighter, is, is, is the lightest punishment in hellfire as opposed to the punishment of Abu Lahab. Um, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from, from hellfire in its entirety. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to enter Jannah without any form of adab or any form of hisab. No form of punishment and no form of accountability. Allahumma ameen. Now, the Prophet sallallahu continued in this hadith and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in the second part of the hadith, so once a person becomes Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ says, فَالْحَسَنَةُ بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهَا إِلَىٰ سَبْعِ مِئَةِ ضِعْفِ وَالسَّيِّئَةُ بِمِثْلِهَا إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَجَاوَزَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ On uh, well, one narration, it's in the mudhakr form, and another one's mu'anna. So uh, basically, a good deed is to be multiplied by 10, up to 700, and the Prophet ﷺ says, and a sin will count only for what it counts for, unless illa an yatajawaz Allahu anha, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives it. So the maximum that a sin can be counted for, obviously, is, uh, is one. And the maximum that good deed, or at least it appears to be in this hadith, would be 700 times. Uh, there's another hadith, Al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala says, or he narrates the second hadith from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu in the same chapter. So this is still in the same chapter because it's an identical hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says, إِذَا أَحْسَنَ أَحَدُكُمْ إِسْلَامَ If one of you improves his, or, or becomes good in his Islam. So we said, حَسُنَ Islama In hadith text, or according to the companions, that his Islam became good, meant that a person was not doing anything that was overly wicked. So he stayed free from the major sins. He did not have any major theological deviancies or any major ideological deviances. Hasuna Islama would mean that a person appeared to be a good Muslim, a good practicing Muslim that was doing his basics and so on and so forth. And of course we said the standard is Ihsan, is excellence, which is that a person works solely for the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So the Prophet ﷺ says, إِذَا أَحْسَنَ أَحَدُكُمْ إِسْلَامَهُ فَكُلُّ حَسَنَةٍ يَعْمَلُهَا تُكْتَبُ لَهُ بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهَا إِلَى سَبْعِ مِئَةِ ضُعْفِ وَكُلُّ سَيِّئَةٍ يَعْمَلُهَا تُكْتَبُ لَهُ بِمِثْلِهَا The Prophet ﷺ says that if one of you follows his Islam properly, then his good deeds will be rewarded ten times to seven hundred times for each good deed, and the sin will be recorded as it is. Okay, tuktabu lahu bimithliha. Now, the, the hadith are identical. Al Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala often uses supporting evidence. The difference between the two ahadith, and the reason why Al Bukhari rahimahullah put them both together, is because the first one is when a person enters into Islam. The first hadith, which we talked about last week, is when a person first takes shahada. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala automatically gives them this reward. It's not like they have to get to a point where, uh, where, where you know, first their good deeds will be like a trial period when they become Muslim. First their good deeds will only count for one and then eventually it will count for ten. When a person becomes Muslim, every good deed is multiplied by ten. So he used the first hadith to show that transition and obviously this hadith to say that this is for everybody. That whenever a person ex uh, accepts Islam, excels in his Islam, then he will be held uh, to the standard. Now, there are several things to point out here. Number one, hasanat, wipe out sayyat. A good deed, by its nature, wipes out a sin. The Prophet ﷺ says, وَأَتْبِعْ الْحَسَنَةَ السَّيِّئَةَ تَمْحُهَا or وَأَتْبِعْ السَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ Follow the sayyat, follow the sin up with a hasana tamhuha. It will wipe it out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتَ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ that good deeds extinguish your sins. Uh, in fact, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in times, good deeds not only extinguish sins, but they even extinguish the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet ﷺ says, Sadaqatu sir. Okay? Tutfi'u ghadab al rabb That when a person gives charity in secret, it extinguishes the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So good deeds by their nature already wipe out sins. They already do away with sins. They are already placed in the place of that sin. However, there is still a condition that a person repents from the sin. So when the Prophet ﷺ says that if you follow up a sin with a hasana, tamhuha, it would wipe it out. What context is the Prophet ﷺ mentioning? That means if you were doing a sin, and then you stopped doing that sin, and instead of doing that sin, you started to do good deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would allow those good deeds to be placed in the place of that sin. إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتَ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ Good deeds extinguish sins means you committed sins, you sought forgiveness for them, and then you started to do good deeds instead, those good deeds wipe them out. Why is this an important concept to clarify theologically? Because you can't say that if I keep on insisting upon this group of sins, as long as I keep on doing more good deeds, the good deeds are going to wipe those out. Okay? Because to insist upon a single sin is a major sin even if it's a minor sin, right? So istighfar is the barrier there. Seeking forgiveness is the barrier there, and that's what brings you into the positive balance. If you keep on sinning, then that means by necessity, if you're insisting on the same sins over and over again, by necessity you're showing disregard to the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to repent from your sins. There's no way to getting around that. You have to seek forgiveness for them, and then hasanat, your good deeds will be placed in place of that sin. There's a beautiful statement from Umar al-Khattab to that effect. Umar said, if you find yourself committing a sin, meaning you committed a sin in a certain location, and then you woke up and you sought forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't leave that setting until you've done a good deed instead. Meaning what? Let's say that you were, that, that you were in uh, a gathering and you, you started to backbite. And then you woke up and realized that you were backbiting, so you said, Astaghfirullah, you sought forgiveness, you undid the damage, or you tried your best to undo the damage. Then don't leave that good deed, don't leave that gathering, that jalsa, without doing something good instead. So instead of just changing the subject, and let's just talk about something else, talk about something good in its place. Or let's say that you were sitting at home and you were on your computer, and you did something that's haram. And then you said, Astaghfirullah. You sought forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then before you leave that room, listen to some Quran on your computer as well. Read something that's good instead. Watch a good YouTube clip or something, right? All right. Do something good in the same place that you committed a sin, right? So that you can put it in its place. Don't just seek forgiveness. Replace the sin with a good deed. 
And by, by default, the hasanat, the good deeds, will automatically wipe out the sins. Now in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned 10 to 700, right? Now what are the best good deeds? What are the best hasanat? The best hasanat, as far as reward is concerned, all right, so we're not talking about ahabul a'mali ilallah adwamuha wa inqal, that the best deeds to Allah are the ones that are consistent. I'm talking about in terms of ajr, in terms of reward. The best hasanat are the ones where the best hasanat are the ones where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows it to forgive all of your sins. So for example, Man Sama Ramadan, Iman and Wahti Saban, whoever fasts Ramadan with faith and holding himself accountable, what's the reward? Allah will forgive him for all of his previous sins. That's the best reward. There's nothing else that the Prophet could say that's better than that. Or, man akala ta'am, whoever eats something, and then he says, Alhamdulillah, alladhi at'amani hadha, wa razaqnihi min ghayri hawlin minni, wa la quwa, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambihi. Whoever eats and makes the dua, Alhamdulillah, alladhi at'amani hadha, wa razaqnihi min ghayri hawlin minni, wa la quwa, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambihi. So, the Prophet ﷺ said it forgives all of your sins. And there are various ahadith where the Prophet ﷺ mentions a good deed and the Prophet ﷺ mentions that all of your sins are forgiven. Or that your sins, even if they were kazarad al-bahr, even if they were equal to the foam of, in the sea, Allah would forgive them all. Those are the best good deeds that exist out there. So if Allah mentions something in the Qur'an or the Prophet ﷺ mentions something in the Sunnah, that includes forgiveness of sins, that's better than if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet ﷺ say, do this and you will get this in return. Right? Because sins are the prevention of a person from getting into paradise. Sins are what stop you. Not a lack of good deeds. It's not a lack of hasanat that gets you into hellfire. It's your sayyat that gets you into hellfire. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every time He mentions a person entering into paradise, it starts off with kafarat al Allah wiping out your sins. So sins, you know, having sins wiped out is better than having good deeds. Do you guys understand this concept or not? Having sins wiped out is better than good deeds. And the greatest good deeds are the ones that cause your sins to be wiped out. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, for example, وَإِنَّ سُوءَ الْخُلُقِ يُفْسِدُ الْعَمَلْ كَمَا يُفْسِدُ الْخَلْ الْعَسَلْ The Prophet ﷺ says, for example, that bad character spoils your good deeds the way that vinegar would spoil honey. Right? So if, you're, if you have some bad, you know, let's say that you pray Qiyamul Layl. All right? MashaAllah, you pray Qiyamul Layl. You come to the masjid, you give sadaqah on the 27th night of Ramadan, and the imam is, you know, calling out your name and whatever it is, and, and you know, all these great things are being punished. But then you go commit zina. Right? Who's better in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The one who didn't give sadaqah, on, the one who gave all that sadaqah and so on and so forth, but committed zina, or the one who didn't commit zina, but just came and prayed taraweeh on Laylatul al-Qadr, or even just prayed Aisha? Who's better in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Clearly, by default, of course Allah knows the hearts, but by default, the person who just did his basics without committing that sin is in a much higher standing in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if he didn't observe Laylatul al-Qadr in ibadah, because he didn't have those sins, to be a barrier between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the ultimate hasanat are the ones that mention forgiveness of sins as well as a good deed. So for example, salah, the reward of salah. What's the reward of prayer? The Prophet ﷺ says that uh, as-salatu ila salah from prayer to prayer, what happens? Kafaratun lima baynahuma, right? Number one, it forgives all of your sins. It forgives all of your sins that are between the two salawats, for example. Then you have all of the rewards that are associated with salah and so on and so forth. The same thing is true with um, Ramadan. Right? The same thing is true with Ramadan. You have, غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ He's been forgiven for all of his sins. But don't you have so much more in Ramadan? Right? You do. Laylatul Qadr. غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ Allah forgives him for all of his previous sins. But is that all you get? No. You get alfi shahr. Right? A thousand months of good deeds. The same thing with Hajj. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would return you back to your home the way that your mother gave birth to you. But what else do you have? لَيْسَ لَهُ jaza illa al-jannah. You also have the reward of paradise. Right? 
So the best good deeds are the ones where you have forgiveness of sins as well as a reward that's associated with it as well. Now, let's go to the number 10 to 700. The Prophet says 10 to 700. Is there an ayah in the Quran that also illustrates this 10 to 700 concept? Anyone know? Come on, guys. Barakallahu feek. Mathalu ladina yunfiquna amwalahum fi sabili lahi kamathali habbatin ambatat sabaha sanabila fi kuli sumbulatin mia tu habba. Wallahu yulahi fuli man yasha. Wallahu wasi un ali. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran the example of those who spend their wealth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like a seed of grain. I'm going to make you guys do math because you look too comfortable. It's like a seed of grain, all right, that has seven spikes, all right? In each spike, there are 100 grains. How much is that? 700, 700 mashallah. All right, it's just in Valley Ranch. We've, everyone said 700, all right? 700. But what does Allah also say in this ayah? Wallahu yudha'ifu liman yasha. But Allah can even go more than that. Wallahu wasi'un alim. And Allah is all encompassing and all knowledgeable. So it's not like Allah is limiting it to 700. All right? Allah can go way further than 700. But this is the range, the general range between 10 and 700. Now, there, is a, there are a lot of questions that come with that. And this is a very beautiful topic, really, to research. I really enjoyed researching this topic. Number one, the basics. All right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the people of Jannah. جَزَاءً مِنْ رَبِّكَ عَطَاءً حِسَابًا That it's a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is purely a gift. <laughs> right? You didn't get to Jannah by your good deeds, but Allah just gave it to you. عَطَاءً حِسَابًا It was a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He increased. He gave you more than you actually deserved when He entered you into Jannah. But when Allah mentions the people of hellfire, جَزَاءً وِفَاقًا Allah gives them their exact punishment. Their exact punishment. So in the, even in the adil, even in the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because on the day of judgment, Allah will deal with you in one of two ways. Either he'll deal with you with his adil, or he'll deal with you with his rahmah. Either he'll deal with you with justice, or he'll deal with you with mercy. Even in his adil, there's rahmah. Even in his justice, there's mercy. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just gives you the bare minimum on the day of judgment, that means that your sin will only be one. There is no such thing as a multiplied sin. Alright? Illa bi mithliha. Allah will only give you exactly what that sin is worth. As for your good deeds, the minimum that your, that your good deed will count for is ten. That's if your good deed didn't have ihsan in it, didn't have any excellence in it, didn't have the nalafin and the voluntary things. That's if your good deed was just making it. All right? Your good deed was just getting by, it will still count for 10. That's the adil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in that justice, there is mercy. In that justice, there is still mercy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as for the mercy that He would deal with a person, it's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would increase that good deed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would shrink the sin. Now, notice the Prophet said the maximum that a sin might count for is its exact nature. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could shrink the sin. He could minimize the sin. All right? Or he could completely yatajawaz anha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could completely wipe it out. But that's the maximum that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would count it against the person. Now with the good deeds, let's take salah for example. Let's take the example of salah. As salah al mafrula Take the mandatory prayers. We said a few weeks ago that every salah counts for how much? Ten. All right? Every salah counts for 10 by default. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala initially ordered 50 prayers until the Prophet sallam, asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring it down to 5. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announced that those 5 will count for 50. That's the default of salah. Now let's say that you beautified that salah. Let's say that you prayed with khushur. Let's say that you you actually tried to understand the words that were being recited. Let's say that you shed a tear. Let's say that you made dua in your sajda. Let's say that you beautified your prayer with some of the sunan, the, 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 the recommended things that aren't necessarily fault. Your salah, your five prayers can count times 700, can count times 100. Now let's say Ibn al-Qayyim ta'ala says something very beautiful. Because it's a fault, because it's a mandatory action, let's say you try to just get your fault right. 
But let's say you didn't have any khushu at all. You came to your prayer, you tried, you're trying to work on yourself, you're trying to have khushu, so you fulfilled all of the external requirements, you did wudu properly, you prayed on time, and you prayed properly, the way the Prophet taught us how to pray, but the internal qualities were missing, but you feel bad about it, and you were working on that. So Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, that person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't punish them. All right. So at the very least, Allah won't punish you because you're trying to fulfill it. If you fulfilled it, it's times 10. If you, ex- if you excelled in it, it's times 100, times 200, times whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make it. Now, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala magnify good deeds? There are several, there are several things. Number one, um, we find what Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, uh, and this is a, a narration that Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah mentions, that there are the blessed times, the blessed times. So for example, what are the, the, the days of the year where good deeds are most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? مَا مِنْ أَيَّامٍ الْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ فِيهِنَّ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ There are no days in which good deeds are more beloved to Allah than what? The first ten days of the Hijjah. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, Ibn al-Jawzi narrates that Anas radiallahu anhu said that the default in the ten days of the Hijjah is 700 as opposed to 10. The minimum in a blessed time gets moved because on, on regular days it's 10. The default goes to 700. And anything more than that is more than 700. SubhanAllah, anything more than that is 700. You understand how beautiful of a concept that is? That if you're doing good deeds in those 10 days, because the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't say that there's no 10 days in which the rahmah of Allah is more, in which the mercy of Allah is more. He didn't say there are more, t- there, there, there are, uh, that, these ten, that these are 10 days in which more people are freed from hellfire than any other 10 days, because that's another 10 days. What 10 days is that? al ashr al-awakhir fi Ramadan, the last 10 nights in Ramadan. But the Prophet ﷺ specified in Dhul Hijjah, Al Amal al Salihu fi Hinna Ahabu illallah. Good deeds in those 10 days are more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than any other time of the year. So you're doing just basic things, for example, the minimum that your good deed counts for, the minimum your salah counts for, the minimum your sadaqa counts for, the minimum your siyam counts for is 700 in those 10 days. Up until whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. We also find, obviously, in Ramadan. Uh, Ibrahim al-Nakhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, and fasting a day in Ramadan is better than fasting a thousand other days. What tasbihatu fi Ramadan, and to glorify Allah in Ramadan, is better than glorifying Him a thousand times in other days. And a single salah, a, a single rak'ah in Ramadan, rak'atun fi Ramadan, one unit of your prayer in Ramadan is better than a thousand units of prayer uh, performed in other days. Imam al-Zuhri rahimahullah ta'ala narrates in an authentic narration, قَالَ تَسْبِيحَةٌ فِي رَمَضَانٍ أَفْضَلُ مِنْ أَلْفِ تَسْبِيحَةٌ فِي غَيْرِهِ One subhanallah in Ramadan is better than a thousand subhanallahs in Ramadan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might do it through the blessed times. Allah will multiply your deeds through your blessed times. Allah might do it just through your niyyah. You might have a really, really good intention when you do a good deed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes the sincerity in your intention and Allah increases your good deed in a way that you can't imagine. Why? Because it's not about the quantity, it's about the quality. It's not about the quantity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need quantity. Allah wants to see quantity, uh, quality. So it might be just that you have a pure heart, a pure intention when you do a good deed, even if it's a very small good deed. It might be through a sunam, through the voluntary things that would increase your prayer. So let me give you guys an example. A salah in Ramadan is worth a thousand times a salah outside of Ramadan. And a salah by default, I'm just going to make you guys keep doing math because it's fun. A salah by default is worth how much? By default, ten times. So five prayers in Ramadan are worth, five prayers a day are worth 50 prayers a day. So 50 prayers a day in Ramadan are worth 50,000 prayers in Ramadan a day. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Salah in jama'ah, to pray in jama'ah is worth 25 to 27 more times than salah alone. You go ahead and multiply 50,000 times 25. I'm not going to make you do that now because I don't know the answer. All right? But it's a lot. 
All right? So adding the sunnah, adding the voluntary things, perfecting it. So you come and you do your salah and jama'ah, for example, in the day of Ramadan, you have no idea how rewarded your prayer suddenly became. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies it by adha'af, by quantities that you can't even imagine. Now some deeds are completely unquantifiable. Some hasanat. There is no way for the Prophet ﷺ to even assign an ajr to it. To even assign uh, a, a particular good deed to it. So for example, in another narration of this very same hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, Al-hasanatu bi'ashri amthaliha that one good deed is worth 10 times uh, itself, up to 700. And in hadith Qudsi form, form Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا الصَّوْمْ Except for fasting. الصَّوْمُ لِي وَنَا Fasting is for me and I'll take care of it. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's an authentic hadith Qudsi with the same words basically, that 10 to 700, but fasting, leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, there is no way I can even quantify. I, can, I, I won't even quantify for you the reward of fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say fast and you get this many good deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as fasting is mine. Fasting is for me and I will reward accordingly. Also, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran very beautifully, Allah azza wa jalla says, فَمَنْ عَفَى uh, فَمَنْ عَفَى وَأَصْلَحَ فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ Whoever pardons, Sheikh Yasser gave the khutbah this week about salamat al-sadr, having peace in your heart, not holding grudges, right? Purifying your heart from holding grudges against people. وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مِنْ غِلًّا Even in, in Jannah, when you get in, there's nothing, no hard feelings in your heart. Allah removes it all. Allah says that when a person chooses to forgive, وَأَصْلَحَ And reconcile. You know, it's one thing to say, fine, I've forgiven him, but I'll talk to him later. I'm not going to go approach that person. Or I've forgiven her, but she can come to me if she wants to talk to me. It's another thing to feel like you've been wrong, but you say, you know what, I forgive you. Let's make up. Hey, I'm coming to your house right now. And to give that person a big hug. All right? And, and you know, and, and take that person out to eat. Well, aslaha. That's just ihsan, right? That's excellence. That's completely unexpected of you. That's completely unexpected of you. It's one thing to forgive. It's another thing to go, well, aslaha. Go and make peace and say, you know what? You know, give me a hug. Let's talk. Let's go out. Take them out to eat, all right? Bring them to Tuesday night halaqa. Some of you might be doing that, right? But again, let's bond. Let's, let's recreate these. Because that's completely unexpected of you. And Allah says, فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ Your good deeds are upon Allah. I'll take care of it. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, he narrates. Because Imam Ahmed was known to be extremely forgiving. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, forgave each and every single person that tortured him. They beat him almost to death. He says, I have forgiven all of them. Even the people that are dead, that didn't get a chance to seek forgiveness from me, I still forgive them anyway. The people that tortured me and died not having sought forgiveness for me, I have still forgiven those people. His son Abdullah said, is there, you know, why is it that you've chosen to forgive all of them? And Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he said, he, he narrated that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have everyone on their knees. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call out for the people that did what? Afa wa aslaha. Those that forgave and reconciled and Allah will tell them to stand up and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them accordingly. Like they will be made to stand alone on the day of judgment because Allah promised them, ajruhu ala Allah. Your good deeds are upon Allah. Wait to see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are some good deeds that aren't even quantified in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So it's not just 10 to 700, it's beyond your imagination, right? And there are some good deeds, finally, that are already mentioned more than 700. All right, some good deeds that are already mentioned more than 700. So for example, Laylatul Qadri, Khairun, and Alfi Shahr. All right, Laylatul Qadr already is better than a thousand months. So that's already more than 700. So Laylatul Qadr, you already know the adha'af. You already know, the alt, you know that the reward of it is already greater than a thousand months. Who can give me another example of a good deed? I'm going to test you guys. I'm going to make you guys answer this question. I'm not going to move on. In fact, I'm going to drink water. It's a chance to drink water. All right, who can give me an example of a particular, du'a, a particular salah, a particular du'a, something, a dhikr, 
where the reward is more than 700. Bismillah. This is where I get to just stare at you guys. What's the reward of Durut? Sallallahu alayhi ashra. Allah sends the response to a person who sends salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu ten times. Anybody else? What's the reward for Subhanallah wa hamdi? You can't just say the dhikr, just hope, hope that there's a hadith for it. I want to hear something that's more than 700. All right, I'm going to give you guys a clue. The reward for praying in Masjid al-Aqsa is 500. The reward for praying in Masjid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the reward for praying in Masjid al-Haram in Mecca is 100,000 salah. You go pray in Al-Haram in Mecca, your salah, which is already multiplied from 10 by default, is up to 100,000 salah. So subhanAllah, there are some good deeds where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already prescribed a number that is way greater than 700. Another example, Rasulullah sallallahu says an authentic hadith. Man dakhla suq whoever enters into the suq and says, La ilaha illallah. Wahdahu la sharika la. Lahu al mulku wa lahu al hamd. Yuhyi wa yumit. Wahuwa hayyun. La yamut. Biyadihi al khayr. Wahuwa ala kulli shayin qadir. I said it very slow so that you can go back and watch the recording inshallah and memorize it or read the dua. Dua al suq. La ilaha illallah. Wahdahu la sharika la. Lahu al mulku wa lahu al hamd. يُحْيِي وَيُمِيتْ وَهُوَ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتْ بِيَدِهِ الْخَيْرِ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ What's the reward of that dua? Prophet said it in authentic... By the way, I'm not even making this up. Hadith Sahih. This isn't some weird hadith. This is an authentic hadith. The Prophet says, whoever says that dua when he enters into the suq, كُتِبَ لَهُ ألف, ألف حسنة. Allah will write for him 1,000 times 1,000 good deeds. What's 1,000 times 1,000? It's a million. I've got news for Al-Arab. Million is not a fusha word. <laughs> alf, alf is, the great, is, is, is a million. One thousand times one thousand. One million hasanat. And Allah would erase from him one million sayyat, sins. And Allah would raise him one million darajat. One million degrees. وَبَنَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ And Allah would build him a house in paradise at that darajah. Keep going for one more to another <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Actually, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he used to go to the suq just to say this dua. So he used to go to the marketplace. But I'll tell you guys what. You, if this is your first time here in the hadith, you're like, that's amazing. That's so easy. You're going to realize in like three weeks that, hey, I've been to the mall and I've been to grocery shopping a few times and I never said the dua. Because it's hard, because when you go to the marketplace, you're already set on something. Your mind is already thinking about what you're going to buy. So that's why if a person thinks of Allah in uh, the, the places that the Prophet ﷺ says are the worst places in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-aswaq, the marketplaces. So you still remember Allah even in those places. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you tijara. Allah gives you, Allah rewards. So you go to the marketplace to shop for something in this dunya, for some inventory in this world. So Allah says, you know what? Or the Prophet is saying, you know what? When you go to the marketplace, instead of thinking about your inventory in dunya, why don't you think about your inventory in Jannah? So if you can remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time, that means the inventory you're really pursuing is the inventory of the hereafter. So one million hasanat, already again, more than 700. So the point is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reward up to whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, and that's why التوفيق إلى العمل الصالح ثواب في ذاته ولو لم تؤجر عليه. Okay, as the scholars say that if Allah guides you to do a good deed, that in and of itself is something that you should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. That in and of itself is goodness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if you don't get extra reward for it. Just the fact that Allah gave you tawfiq, Allah gave you the ability to do a good deed, and that is the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll, gi- I'll give you guys uh, two more narrations, then we'll end inshallah. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he said, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to enter a person into Jannah, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Because on the day of judgment, let's say, for example, you did good deeds, but let's say that you did some sins. Let's say you had a really, really sincere good deed that you did. But you also had a lot of sins. 
So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? What happens? How is that possible? Especially if they involve people. I'll give you an example. The man who killed 99 people and then he killed 100. And he sought forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've already established. Look, the rights of people, they will be established on the day of judgment. Right? So that man still has to pay for the 100 lives that he took. But what did the Prophet ﷺ say happens to him at the end? Does he go to hell or does he go to paradise? He goes to Jannah. How does that even work? Or the Zania, the prostitute that gave water to a thirsty dog. How does she end up in Jannah? <laughs> Despite all the adultery that she's committed for giving water to a dog. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make that happen? So for example, the guy that killed 100 people, do those 100 people suddenly have their right taken away from them? Just because this guy decided to make tawbah and move on to another place? No. And Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would forgive their sins that don't involve other people. So that's number one. يُكَفِّرُ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ So Allah would forgive the sins that don't involve other people. Number two. As for the sins that do involve other people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward those victims, would give them what they deserve, in full without decreasing from them. So then how does this person get to Jannah then? He said that Allah would take even his smallest good deed, and Allah would increase it abu'af until it covers all of those transgressions, and enters him into Jannah. So you've got this huge bubble of sins. But Allah saw a sincere repentance from you. Look, you made sincere tawbah. You changed your life. That's good for you, but you still, <laughs> you still wronged me 10 years ago. I'm happy to hear that you've moved on in your life and so on and so forth. Right? And maybe, you didn't, maybe I passed away and you didn't get a chance to seek forgiveness from me. All right, well, I want my haq. Or maybe you passed away somewhere else before you could seek forgiveness from me. So, hey, what about my right? I'm glad you changed your life, but... That doesn't give me back my $200, right? Good for you, but I still want my reward. So Allah would basically take the good deed, his tawbah, his good deed, and increase it to where it can absorb, it can take the hit without decreasing anything from the people that he owes. That's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's if Allah accepts a good deed from you. That doesn't mean go wrong people and just hope for one of your hasanat to work. Right? That means if you sought forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you did a good deed sincerely for him and Allah found it worthy enough and found your intention sincere enough, Allah will take care of the rest. Because Allah, there is no limit. If it was limited, if the good deed was limited to 700, then, you know, too bad. Your, your, your sins are too many. But Allah, if he's going to enter a person into Jannah by his rahmah, Allah will increase that good deed to where it absorbs all of those sins that a person committed which is why Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, لَوْ عَلِمْتُ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَبِلَ مِنِّي رَكْعَتَيْنِ If I knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted from me two rak'ahs, لَتَمَنَّيْتُ الْمَوْتِ I would just wish that Allah would take my life. Because if Allah accepts the good deeds of a single person, if Allah accepts one of your good deeds, أَدْخَلَكَ الْجَنَّةِ Allah will enter you into paradise. Out of all the good deeds that you do, Allah just has to accept one. Allah just has to accept one. And so in conclusion, number one, don't play the numbers game with Allah. Don't play the numbers game with Allah. It's not about how many good deeds you do, it's about your sincerity. Don't say, well, I've done this many good deeds. You know, after Ramadan's over, you know, I think I can afford to go party for a few days. 30 times, if I calculate my salah, I pray jama'ah this many times. This sin's pretty bad, but, you know, 10 days to take care of this sin, 10 days, I got this covered. It doesn't work that way. You go through your Ramadan. Seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outside of Ramadan. You do those good deeds. You pray every single time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it from you. And you just hope that just one of those good deeds is accepted. And you don't purposely go and sin and disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is belittling the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're trying, right? You do as many good deeds as you can. Just hope one of them is accepted. And inshallah ta'ala, you would be good you don't play the numbers game with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man khashiya rahman I read Surah, al- I read surah Al-Qaf in Irsha for a reason. So beautiful. Man khashiya rahman bil ghaybi jaa bi qalbin munib. All you have to do is come to Allah with a pure heart. A pure heart surely would have yielded a pure good deed at some point that Allah would accept. 
And that's why we find many of the Salaf, many of the pious predecessors, Allah did not accept from them, for example, or their students would see them in a, see them in a dream in Jannah. They would say, how did you get to Jannah? And the person, the, the, the alim, would say that Allah did not accept anything from me except for these two rak'ahs that I prayed in the secret of the night when no one else was seeing me. All the da'wah, everything like that. All I needed was those two rak'ahs. Allah took those two rak'ahs and Allah entered me into Jannah with those. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He puts sincerity in our heart, that He forgives us for our shortcomings, that Allah multiplies our good deeds by His mercy and that Allah deals with us on the Day of Judgment with His mercy as opposed to His justice. Allahumma ameen. Questions? I'm going to start with, yes. No, no, behind you, sorry. In our day-to-day -day life, yes, sir. we may be committing a number of minor sins and even major sins. Correct. Can we categorize the major sins and the major good deeds? Okay. Can we categorize the major sins there, there are, and, and the major good deeds? So the question is, during our during our day-to-day -day life, we make many, many mistakes. We commit many minor sins and so on and so forth. Can we categorize the major sins uh, and the major good deeds? The ulama differed, because the Prophet ﷺ certainly mentioned, you know, for example, sab al mubiqat the seven destructive sins, the major destructive sins. Some of the ulama they said that uh, a major sin, um, you know, where the Prophet ﷺ says la kabira ma al istighfar, wala sagira ma al israr. Prophet ﷺ says there is no such thing as a major sin if you seek forgiveness for it, and there is no such thing as a minor sin if you insist upon it, because it's not about the size of the sin. Okay, but unvor ila awamati man asait. You look at the greatness of the one that you've disobeyed. All right, so it's not about the size of the sin; it's about disregarding Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's sight upon you. So for the minor sins, you commit your natural minor sins throughout the day. Natural. That's where the wudu, the salah purifies. Juma to Juma purifies. Ramadan to Ramadan purifies, and so on and so forth. Major sins require specific tawbah. They require specific repentance. And those are the, the major sins that the Prophet ﷺ classified, the sins that involve fahsha, that involve a sense of shamelessness and so on and so forth. And you seek specific forgiveness for them. Uh, and, and if they involve people, again, you, you return the rights of those people. You do hajj if you can. But sincere tawbah can do away with anything. So uh, your daily minor sins are taken care of, inshallah, with your daily istighfar, your daily prayer, your daily wudu, and so on and so forth. And the major sins can be done away with with tawbah, inshallah, with repentance. Sisters, yeah. Yes. When does a sin convert to a hasana? Does anyone know? When does a sin actually convert to a good deed? If you repented for that sin, if you sought forgiveness for that sin that sin actually becomes a good deed. Istighfar is a good deed. Seeking forgiveness is a good deed. So repentance would actually replace the sin on your record on the Day of Judgment. Okay? Yeah. So, um, sin, um, like arrogance, in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Great question. All right, so the, the, the hadith, for example, where the Prophet ﷺ says that a person who has an atom's worth of pride in his heart would not enter Jannah. But did the, the question is, did the Prophet ﷺ connect it to an identifiable behavior? Or did the Prophet ﷺ simply mention it as something that just it stuck somewhere in your heart? The Prophet ﷺ connected it to an identifiable behavior. Actually, two of them. Batarul haqq wa ghamtun nas. To deny the truth or to belittle a person. All right? Uh, so what that means is, denying the truth is actually saying outright that you don't want to, that, you, that you're going to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll deny the truth, or taking a deviant interpretation to suit your needs, a baseless deviant interpretation to suit your needs. So, well, this ayah doesn't really mean that. And the only reason you're saying this ayah doesn't really mean that is because you don't want to do it. And so you'll take an opinion that hasn't been found for 1400 years, and you'll say, well, this ayah doesn't really say that. So that's belittling the, the legislation, that's denying the legislation, and then belittling people, all right, putting someone down, saying to someone, you won't go to Jannah, Allah won't forgive you, or I am better than you, and a khayrun min, all right? So it's an identifiable behavior. Just feeling that way about someone. Feeling that way, you battle your feelings. 
You have a feeling, you battle it. Allah won't punish you for your thoughts. So that, this, is a, this is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah won't punish you for your thoughts. All right? Allah will punish you for your actions. That's where, the, that's where the problem is. So if you have pride in your heart and you don't deal with it, it's going to result in identifiable behavior. So you need to seek forgiveness for it and remove it from your heart even if that identifiable behavior has not come out yet. Allah knows best. Uh, I'll take one sister, one brother, and then I'll stop for tonight. Yeah. What is the sign that your tawbah has been accepted? There are many signs. All right. One sign is that you don't insist upon a sin. That you found that you're not insisting upon a sin. Another sign is that you feel more sweetness in your ibadah. That you start to feel more sweetness in your prayers. You start to feel more sweetness in your repentance of Qur'an. Um, another sign, uh, there, there are many signs and it really depends on the sin. Another sign is that the way that you view Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than the way you viewed him before. So essentially, the way that we look at our deeds is we look at the behavior that comes after the deeds. So the sign of an accepted Ramadan is continued goodness. The sign of an accepted Hajj is continued goodness. So it's about what comes afterwards. Now there are people, and I, and I need to make this very clear, there are people that make sincere tawbah, but they are so deep in a certain sin that even though their tawbah is sincere at the moment, they still get pulled into a sin. They still get pulled into that same sin. That doesn't necessarily mean that that person's tawbah was not sincere at the time. Because Allah says, وَلَمْ يُصِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ They didn't insist upon it at the time. So when they made istighfar, it wasn't astaghfirullah, and I know I'm going to do this tomorrow, but I do feel bad about it, Allah. It's astaghfirullah, I'm quitting, I'm going to stop, I'm going to try. But then they go back and they do it again. So it's not like there's residual punishment. Like Allah goes back and says, oh, your tawbah was not sincere in the first place. No, it could have been sincere at the time. So it's about actually the, the action. It, it's basically the plan that you put in place. The sincerity, the regret, and nadimu tawbah. The Prophet ﷺ says that regret is tawbah. So if you really have regret in your heart when you commit a sin, that's tawbah, that's sincere tawbah. Um, but in our religion, look, we, we, uh, when we make istighfar, we move on. Right? We don't beat ourselves up. We don't have despair. We don't beat ourselves up over a sin that was committed in the past. We move on with our lives. Like if you think about the Sahaba and the horrible things that some of them did before Islam, yet they were still able to progress in a way that they became the best generation that, that mankind has ever seen. That's pretty phenomenal when you think about it. Like they didn't sit around and cry over what they used to do in Jahiliyyah. You know, that whole narration uh, supposedly about Umar radiallahu anhu laughing and then crying because he buried his daughter alive and he, uh, and, and he made an eye. That, that's complete moldur. It doesn't even, doesn't even exist. It's a baseless story altogether. <laughs> so they're a fab, it's a fabrication. You don't find the Sahaba crying about what they used to do in Jahiliyyah because they knew that Allah brought them Islam and they changed their life. So you change your life and you move on. Allah Alright, right, last question from the brothers. Tadlari Shaykh. So the question is, how do we uh, reconcile between the statement of Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu that if I would have known that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have accepted a good deed from me, then I would, I would have wished for death. And the hadith of the Prophet don't wish for death. They're two different contexts. When the Prophet says, لا تتمنوا الموت, don't wish for death, he's talking about a person that wishes for death out of hatred for the dunya, or out of depression, or out of sadness, or out of something that, out of something else. What Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu is saying is, uh, it's, it's, it's theoretical because you will never know that Allah accepted a good deed from you. And when he says law, kalimat law, huna, when he says law, if I knew. <laughs> no, that's a different say. <laughs> that's in qada and qadr. Naam? It's an exaggeration. It's something that's impossible because there is no way to know that Allah accepted a good deed from you. So that's the point. So you keep working and you keep wishing for Allah to accept your good deeds and then when you die, you find out hopefully that Allah accepted that good deed and subhanAllah, subhan al khaliq you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> Just imagine, you know, you meet Allah and you find out that your Ramadan was insincere, your hajj was insincere. But you held the door open for an elderly person. You 
gave charity to somebody, you volunteered one day, you held something for someone, you know, you, you said astaghfirullah one time, you listened to some Qur'an and you shed a tear, and that's what gets you into Jannah, and you go, wow. Right? You have no idea. That's the point. When the Prophet said, I saw a man strolling in Jannah because he removed something harmful from the road. You know, this guy shows up on the Day of Judgment. Allah Adam, he's probably he's a mu'min, he's a believer. He's got all the stuff going for him. But the deed that got him in Jannah was removing some garbage from the road. So you don't know. You don't know. But the, the heart of the believer is awake. It's conscience. It's, it's conscious. It's looking. It's searching for ways to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Adam. Taib, I said last question, but for you, I'll make an exception of Amr. Tadlan. Naam. Al Hadith la yqul whatever ma'alashir. Taib, tadlan. Naam. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, if that person, when he was removing something harmful from the road, for example, do you think he was going, I'm going to remove this from the road and I'm going to be strolling in Jannah? Or do you think he had something nice and sincere in his heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No one was watching. He said, Rabbana taqabbal and just move something from the road. Right? So that's the idea here. And I am what my servant expects of me. Means that. You, you don't think, uh, you don't have su'a dhan in Allah, you don't think evil of Allah. That's a very big topic. You don't think evil of Allah, that Allah is out to get you. That Allah likes to punish. That Allah doesn't want to accept your forgiveness. That Allah wants to close doors in your face. That Allah wants to give you a miserable life. That Allah wants to put you in hellfire for a few days. You think of Allah in a good way. And that's a ibadah. That's an act of worship. That, oh Allah, you're so merciful that you're not even going to look down upon this good deed of me removing something harmful from the road. Even this is enough to get your mercy. That Allah is so beautiful and Allah is so merciful that you know when you're doing these little tiny good deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who's controlling the heavens and the earth and who sees all the the demons that you have in your life and all the not so good things you have in your life, but Allah is still willing to accept this if I do it sincerely for him. That's husn al And I know that if I come on the Day of Judgment and I tried my best, sincerely tried my best, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not punish me. That's husn al billah. That's thinking well of Allah. But you can't think well of Allah, you can't claim to think well of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an excuse for your sins. Okay? So you can't say, you know, as you're committing sins, well, alhamdulillah, Allah is most merciful. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Bani Israel. وَقَالُوا لَن تَمَسَّنَا النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودًا They said, oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will only, you know, if we go to hell, we'll only go for a few days. It doesn't work that way. Because then you're belittling, or you're seeking to belittle Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you're not going to, that shows that you don't think well of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you thought well of Allah, then you would do well for Allah. You see the difference? You see the connection? Think well of Allah, then do well for Allah. If you think low of Allah, then you won't do anything for Allah. So husn al billah should translate into actions uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu ta'ala. Uh, what are the Islamic injections about uh, music? Uh, what is painting, poetry? Oh, that's a long question, Shaykh. How about me and you talk about that personally, inshallah, right now? So I can let everyone go, inshallah. Jazakumullah khayran, subhanakumullah, muhammadik, ashadu wa la ilaha ilaha ant, astaghfiruka. وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْكَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ رَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ